there is no hate to Stewie. Like Stewie is extremely deserving. If Asia would have won it, she's extremely deserving. Of exactly. What, what a time for our league that we have three candidates that had phenomenal last seasons to be yeah. like even in the in the mix for it. But AT is QB one. She yeah. is defender one. She is like she has triple doubles. All of it. I don't know if y'all understand how hard it is to have a triple double. Like oh my god, and on for two real. torn shoulder labrums. She That's does all this thing. on two torn shoulder labrums. That's what I'm saying. Like two torn labrums, right? First of all, I didn't even like know that until like a few years ago. And I was like, pause. Yes. You're doing what? <laughs> yeah, like, people would be trying to flame her for a shot. I'm like, if y'all only knew she has two, yeah. two torn labrums up there. Presented by State Farm. So welcome back to Sometimes I Hoop. We've got a tough veteran hooper on the pod today. Quick humble brag, a quick humble brag about our superstar. 2019 WNBA champ, Washington Mystics franchise leader in assists. 2022 WNBA all defensive first team, none other than Natasha Cloud. Thank you for being on. Thank you for hyping me up, girl. (laughs) Girl, you deserve it. You deserve it. I appreciate it. We'll just jump right into the landscape. Playoffs are in full swing. You and I both got knocked out in the first round, which was tough. Uh, It was tough. (laughs) It's tough. It's tough. But I mean, you were on one, creating chaos out there, wreaking havoc on the defense. Uh, You you had a 33 ball, which was insane. (laughs) Insane. Insane. But just talk to us about the series. What was that like? You were just being a menace out there everywhere. So tell us about it. Yeah, honestly, we were happy that y'all finished in six because we just didn't match up with Dallas well. So we were like, we're, as a team, we feel much more comfortable going into a series with New York. We had just played them. We felt like we matched up well. Uh, Mm -hmm. But obviously the story of our season was just injuries. And for any team to lose three starters for two months of their season, I don't even know if a team would have gotten into playoffs. So with that being said, I'm really proud of our team, our resiliency, we played with the great eight for like two months. Um, but that's that series. We finally got Elena back. We got a back. Um, obviously, we're still missing Shakira, which people don't give her the credit that she deserves. She is the anchor of our defense. Like mm-hmm. you want to talk about. Yes, I like to get out and guard. But when I get beat, the first thing I yell is Kira. So <laughs> <laughs> not having that luxury of having a rim protector, someone that can bang with fives. That was really hard for us all season. But yeah. Uh, game one, New York kind of came out. They were on fire. Everyone, what they were shooting percentage wise from the floor was like, Crazy. we literally, we can't do nothing. Like there is <laughs> nothing that we can do that's slowing you down. And, uh, obviously I started on Sabrina, but we were switching a lot more, um, within mm-hmm. the first game. And so I feel like she got freed up, um, got, got off, had like seven, three set, like a, a record. So Going into game two, uh, for me, it was like completely, I got to be a villain. I got to take Sabrina completely out of being an X factor for them. And yeah. uh, switching us, me getting off of her, that just doesn't benefit us as a defensive-minded team. So um, just trying to keep a bigger, stronger guard on her, um, mm-hmm. get in her stuff, kind of get into her head. Like there was points where... Uh, they were coming down and we would be in the corner and I would literally just have, I would be face guarding her, have my head on her stomach, like pushing her with my head, yeah. just like straight villain stuff. And it's respect. Like a lot of people um, at the end of the day, I think I get made to be a villain, but I really am just passionate about this game. I love defense. I love being our go-to defender. Um, and that night, it just so happened that my defense brought my offense too. And uh, you know, playing in that environment in a Barclays Center that sold out. We dream of those mm-hmm. moments since we we're kids. So I was definitely like in the driveway, like, oh yeah, three, two, one on the shot clock, yeah. just pulling stuff. Um, yeah. But it unfortunately it didn't kind of fall in our favor. And that's a part of the game, right? Failure is a part of this game. And it's why we love it. It's why we continue to fight and get better and re attack and figure out, pivot different ways. And um, you know, it was, uh, it was hard, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, you always want to win a championship. It's always hard to get knocked out and to be swept. That's not fun either. Yeah. Like as a competitor, that shit sucks for me. Like I, I was a sad girl for like three straight days <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> it stings. It stings. You got to wallow it in it for a bit, but not too you long. You have to. Yeah. Not yeah. too long, but like sitting there for like two days, don't leave the apartment. <laughs> no one say nothing to me. <laughs> I'm with you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Aces are up 2-0 against the Wings. Liberty and mm-hmm. Sun are tied. 
what have you been liking seeing in these first few semifinals games? Because I feel like they've been a little all over the place. They've been close, and then Dallas yeah. Aces have, have not been so close. But it's it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Honestly, the Dallas Aces series surprised me more than anything because Dallas mm-hmm. has been so great all season long, and yeah. they present like <laughs> you want to talk about like bigs in our league or slim pickings they have like six of them <laughs> all of six them. five six five six six all six seven them. six seven i'm like y'all is the monsters and i love it but for real the aces the aces are phenomenal right and asia is just playing on a different level like even watching yeah. the game the other night i was like oh, the mvp thing gonna turn her up but yeah. seeing the look in her eye that that woman is determined to win a back-to-back and you can mm-hmm. see it so it's like who literally is going to get in front of her and stop her? Like who is going yeah. to take it upon themselves? And so that Dallas series is a little surprising as far as the New York series, New York and Connecticut series. Like that is a series that I'm very invested yeah. into because it is so close. Like those two teams play each other really well. Uh, New York obviously tied up the series one, one. I feel like mm-hmm. Connecticut came out in that first game and punched New York. Like it was, uh, mm-hmm. it was a wake up call for New York. Like, this is a different series than our series with them. Connecticut is a team that will literally run through you to win a game. And they don't, ca- they don't care. So you have to match yeah. their physicality. And I don't think that New York did that on in the first game. Um, but I will say the other night, New York came out and I was so excited to see them match that physicality because I didn't know if they could. And um, mm-hmm. that's just me being honest with you. Like that physicality that Connecticut plays with is a different type of dog. And I don't think people yeah. realize that. So I'm excited. Connecticut is really hard to play at. They're great at home. Um, yeah. It's really hard to get a win in that that building. But New York is just a great team. I would like to see Stewie get going. I would like to see mm-hmm. them get Stewie some easier touches early, so she's not shooting contested shots all the time. But yeah, um, other than that, Benaja Laney has been the X factor for them, I and she's not about talked about that. enough. She is not talked about enough, and it makes me so mad because you can have those franchise players, and we right, we love it, but mm-hmm. you. They the only way that franchise players are franchise players is if everyone else around them does their role. And mm-hmm. Naj does her role to the best of her ability and plays hard every single night. She brings it every single night, whether yeah. they have it or not. So um, I just want to make sure I give a shout out to her, too, because she's playing phenomenal. I mean, in this playoffs right now, we have so many heavy hitters. We have all three of that MVP race. And Stewie ended up getting it. Okay, what did... was your opinion? I was, I was about to ask question. you. No, okay, so my, my prediction prior is I always laid it out. And first of all, three of some of the most amazing players we've ever amazing, seen. Right? Amazing, like, amazing, amazing. All of them are having these stellar seasons as they yes. all always do. And so I was like, okay, Asia going to do her, Stewie going to do her. But for me, AT... Talk about having, it. Having a season like this where you're averaging almost a Mm triple-double and you're doing it on a team where, you know, Brianna Jones, who's an all-star, goes out. Connecticut would not be where Connecticut is without AT doing what she's doing. And so I've always been like, you know, AT and I mean, Stewie and Asia, amazing, amazing Amazing. MVP caliber seasons. But you take Asia and Stewie off of those teams. You can talk about the Aces. Kelsey, Jackie, Chelsea, right? You just go they on and on so and on. Good. Exactly. But you take AT off of Connecticut and the value that she brings there is it's it's uncomparable. Exactly. So that's always been my argument. But flip it back to you. It seems like we have a similar point of view <laughs> going do, on here. We do. I, I think because we both appreciate underdogs too, right? Yeah. Of like yeah. There is no hate to Stewie. Like Stewie is extremely deserving. If Asia would have won it, she's extremely deserving. Of exactly. What, what a time for our league that we have three candidates that had phenomenal last seasons to be yeah. like even in the in the mix for it. But I had the same sentiments. What Alyssa Thomas it has done this season, we have never seen in this league. Never. What Stewie has done, what Asia has done, we've seen it before. Like I'm yeah. not, I'm not taking no knock off of that because what they are able to do right now is and the efficiency that they are playing yeah. at two all season like that is something to be said but again if you take at off of connecticut they are not in the semifinals yeah they're yeah. not even close I don't, I don't even know for real like what if, if they would i'm gonna say they would be in the playoffs because db is still tough like they mm-hmm. have other pieces right and tiff and beck but at is qb1 
She yeah. is defender one. She is like, she has triple doubles. All of it. I don't know if y'all understand how hard it is to have a triple double. Like, oh my God. And on For two real. torn shoulder labrums. She That's does all this thing. on two torn shoulder labrums. That's what I'm saying. Like two torn labrums, right? First of all, I didn't even like know that until like a few years ago. And I was like, pause. Yes. You're doing what? <laughs> yeah. Like, people would be trying to flame her for a shot. I'm like, if y'all only knew she has two, yeah. two torn labrums up there. And then you take that into account. She's doing all of this. No three balls. You're no three balls. Getting, Zero. Triple dubs. No three balls. It's like and you get the way that you guard teams. her. Exactly. And then on top of that, you're doing it from a forward position. And yes. then you take Brandon Jones out of the equation. She's kind of playing the center in their starting lineup. She so for is. you to be for you to be averaging a triple dub playing the center is insane. You're out it's here insane. guarding. It's insane. You're you're guarding Big T, getting a triple dub, grabbing Ooh, rebounds, like, whatever. So that's the frustrating part within like the voting around our league is like yeah. there is bias. There's the fact that someone gave Asia Wilson and I'm I am determined to figure out. I am determined who? to figure out who gave Asia Wilson that fourth place because you got to see me and that's not even my teammate. You got to see me. Who's voting? I the media. Know who who the gave media, the fourth place the, vote? The media. <laughs> the media. Which is crazy. AT would have been voted MVP if our league voted. Yeah. Like if players voted, coaches voted. I, I, I really do feel like AT would have won because we see her. And we, mm-hmm. all, we all are in some way being like, you know what, damn. Like at some point you got to give this girl her flowers before it's yeah. too late, right? So, I mean, it is what it is. Again, I like congrats to Stewie in all of this. Mm-hmm. I don't ever want to take away from Stewie and the player that she is. And unfortunately, I don't think that's what the media understands is because they vote with bias. Now Stewie gets looked at like, oh, well, you didn't deserve this. No, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. You, you played a phenomenal season. You deserve this. But what AT is doing on the other side has never been done in our women's yeah. game ever, ever. But turning it towards you a little bit in your early basketball career, growing up, was basketball like, was that your thing? Or who put the ball in your hands? Why basketball? Tell me about it. Growing up in a in a middle class family, right? That my dad's working two jobs to keep a roof over our head and food on the table. Like I knew basketball was my way out. And I feel like mm-hmm. a lot of people that look like us, that is the case. And so understanding that I could go get a college degree that I wouldn't be able to afford elsewise Mm -hmm. that I can potentially go try. And obviously I didn't know I'm a mid-major kid. So I'm like the WNBA, they're, they're not even necessarily like on my radar. It's just like, how can I put myself in the best position moving forward through this game that God has given me like this beautiful, beautiful game. And, you know, then I go to St. Joe's, I start going crazy and I'm like, hold on. Like we're playing like, we played Maryland after the mm-hmm. year I transferred out of Maryland, mm-hmm. beat them. They were top five in the country at the time. Played Syracuse when Slim was on there. We lost by one. So we were playing all these top teams in the country. Went to Notre Dame, only lost by like seven. Yeah. And in that, I was like, oh, no, I can do this. Like, I'm guarding Drew. Hey. I'm guarding <laughs> AT. Like, I'm guarding Slim. I'm, I'm guarding all these players that are top like prospects for the draft next season. Yeah. Um, and I think I think within that, the Mystics started coming to watch me. And that was so exciting for me, like a, a mid-major kid, an underdog, yeah. someone that's always been told, like, you're good, but you're not good enough. Right. Mm-hmm. That was really special for me. So that was the only team. Fifteenth pick early in the second round and the Mystics being the only team that reached out. And then you get to the league and it's this crazy adjustment. So it really is. What what was that period like for you as you get to training camp, you get to the league, this and that? Was there kind of a rookie wall that you would say you hit that you had to push through and adjust to feel comfortable Ooh. in the league? So I will say when I when I came in, even though I was drafted, you know, as uh, as a draft pick, like you still have to earn your spot. No guarantees. People don't, like, we don't talk There's about none. that. There is no guarantee. So you still have to earn your spot. So I very much went into that training camp. Like I need to bust everybody, Mm -hmm. like including the people that have already been on this team. Mm -hmm. But again, it's another level. So high school to college is a different level. College to pros is a different level. And I would even say like even college to overseas and overseas to the W is a whole other level. So, and as a point guard, 
you're hitting the ground running. Like it was my rookie moment, like my first year. It's just like we have 20 plays in this playbook. I have to remember Mm -hmm. all of them. I have to be able to put you and be confident enough as a 23 year old to tell a 31 year old, get your ass to the block. Mm hmm. I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, do you mind, like, maybe hey, if you're yeah. free going to that block? <laughs> Excuse me, if you had the time of your day, I would really appreciate. And it's not oh, just like learning the place for yourself. The thing that got me that T gets on me about is you have to know the place, but you have to know where everybody else is. On yes. top of that, like, I have to know what actions Ryan likes, what action Alicia likes, yes. where CP wants the ball. And I have to know all this. And I'm like, all of that. What? You're like, I'm on overload. I I just brought yeah. myself to the game today. Like, that was <laughs> a win it. for me. That was a win <laughs> for me. I'm here. <laughs> yes, I made it here. Be proud. Yeah. Just talking about, um, you know, traits. Nobody's safe in this league. All this different stuff. You Ugh. acquire a Hall of Famer, Elena Deladon, right? Uh-huh. What is that like? You come back from Australia and now you have these amazing, uh, more amazing players with you. What is that like working somebody of that caliber into the oh, team, man. you being a point guard, learning how to play with somebody like that, the tendencies, all these different things. What is that experience like? It has been the greatest blessing to my career to play alongside Elena Deladon. Um, mm-hmm. She is truly, truly, I, I don't care what people are saying um, after this season. Like, I'll get into that later. But this is, to me, this is the best player in the entire world. I played with her for six years and I got to witness and experience her greatness and not mm-hmm. only experience her greatness on the court, but experience her humbleness and her heart off the court. And I think yeah. sometimes, which I love our league, because I feel like a lot of the franchise players are like very just dope and down to earth, right? But you do have the, the, some of those franchise players that you're like, wow, okay. Have you lost touch with reality? Because yes. we're here on planet we're here. Earth. <laughs> we're here, okay? Um, I've never had that from Elena. Not yeah. once in my six years of playing with her. It's always been about, yeah, like I know who I am for us, but this is, I, I only go as you go. I only go mm-hmm. as we go. And so I had to quickly learn, like, this is the best player. Where do you need the ball? Like asking little things about where do you need the ball placed for your shot pocket? Like Mm -hmm. those are big things when it comes to players like that. So um, because she's so versatile, because she's so great at what she does, she's able to extend to the three, pass the three, NBA three. She's able to shoot off the dribble. She can post up on the block. Um, She just has such versatility to her game. It literally makes my job as a point guard so freaking easy. So yeah. Even a lot of my accolades, what I've been able to do in my career are literally a direct correlation to Elena Deladon. And I'm so mm-hmm. thankful for that. Um, but it got to a point where it was just like, it was Batman and Robin. Like people really mm-hmm. referred to us as Batman and Robin because you could not stop us in the pick and roll. Like, yeah. And regardless if Elena was involved in the offense or not, like I was always going to find her. And it became a point to where like statistically, if I was off the court, Elena's numbers went down like, tremendously opposed to when I was actually on the court with her. So in talking about how hard it is to get to this league, but stay in this league, like you have to find what you do and do it well. I did Mm -hmm. that, which then made a franchise player be like, I'm not playing with any other point guard. This is my point guard. That solidified my role in DC for however many more years. So it really has been a Batman Robin thing. I've been blessed to be able to play with the best player in the world. Um, one of the most humble players in the entire world. And um, it really is sad to see how people approach her now. Yeah. Um, and it's not even sad. Like I'll fight about her. Like I will mm-hmm. fight about Elena and I don't, no one could ever, ever, ever go through what this woman went through three back surgeries. She won us a championship on three herniated discs in her back. We were literally shooting this girl up with medicine before our games. And she might not tell y'all, but I'm telling y'all because it's just not fair. The backlash that she receives now, like Mm -hmm. to go into a major surgery, like a back surgery and your doctor, fuck it up. Your doctor that you went to, that you entrusted with your career, your life, your longevity of just like life right? Mm-hmm. Fucks it up. You got to go back in. Now something's else wrong. You got to go back in. And then your recovery, Haley, she gets to the gym at 6 a.m. every morning and doesn't leave till 6 p.m. And yeah. that has been her last three years. Like, yeah. so not only do I have to go through 
back surgery after back surgery after back surgery. Now, anyone that's ever been through a major injury and has come back, you know how hard that is physically, mentally, emotionally, Mm -hmm. spiritually to do that three times. And then to be a franchise player that's expected to be who she is, to get the backlash that she gets, people talking shit like, oh, she should just retire. Are you out of your fucking mind? Yeah. Because even with all of that happening, Elena was still able to come back this season and put up her average nor- numbers. And that's without yeah. practicing. That's, yeah. She did not practice. So mm-hmm. it's like, she's going to rehab her ankle. She's going to rehab her back. And then we throw her into the game. And this girl is averaging 20 points in this game. Like, that's insane to me. So yeah. I just, Elena Deladon is one of the most special players that has ever played this game. Um, I love that girl through and through. It's been a blessing to play alongside her. Um, And we've done some really great things together that I'm really proud of too. You talked about what she did for you in your career, but also the Mystics organization. In 2019, you guys come in and you have that championship run and you guys win, which is... Which is amazing. I remember it's watching that. Crazy. That's when I graduated high school. And it was just like watching you guys. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Don't do that to me, Haley. <laughs> I had to throw it in. But like, Damn. Watching, Damn. watching how the city got behind you guys. And just, yes. the, just like the influence that you guys had that year on the WNBA was incredible. So what? talk me through that final sweep, just that whole year, how that season went. Because... When she came in in 2017, and then all of a sudden you guys win two years later, mm-hmm. it's it's an insane turnaround to have. It's an insane turnaround. And we almost we almost fucked around and won the year before, but we just met yeah. a, better, a better Seattle team. And like, they were crazy that year, too. Oh, what? Because they, they still had Stewie, Tosh, uh, Sue, Alicia Clark. Like I was yeah. like, this is unfair, bro. It don't <laughs> matter what we do on defense. Like You have a counter yeah. to everything. So... Mm-hmm. When we lost in 2018, we sat in that locker room. And after the coaches left, we were like, we essentially, Seattle is the version of ourselves that we want to be. We're not Mm -hmm. there yet. We just saw that we're not there yet, but we're right there. So you can be. Yeah, like we can be. So if each of us leaves this locker room and approaches this offseason to get 1% better and to bring that back to this team, we're going to win a championship the next year. Mm -hmm. So the whole off season, we all like, you know, it's, it's hard to stay, you know, see, it's hard to stay attached to your teammates in the off season, like overseas and life and everything's going on. We all stayed so attached to that off season and it was constantly run it back, run it back. Like, yeah. you know, when you, when you on when you're playing like pickup and you get scored up, run that shit back. Like, mm-hmm. so that's very much what our mindset was going into that 2019 season. And all of us did what we said we were going to do. We came back 1% better. So that whole training camp, like, I can't tell you, we came in, I was like, we look scary good. Mm -hmm. We have Elena Della. Our starting five was me, Christy, Ariel Atkins, Elena Deladon, Latoya Sanders, which Latoya Sanders, our coach, she doesn't get the credit that she deserves. She was our anchor for everything that year. Mm -hmm. Off our bench is Emma Misamin. That's Emma crazy. Misa off the Min. bench. Off the off bench. The bench. It's wild. It's you have an all star. You have one of the best players to ever play in the W and doesn't get the respect that she deserves either coming off our bench. So yeah. we were just, we were scary. And I'm telling you, I've never felt more confident than that season. It didn't matter what game we went into, it didn't matter who we were facing. I was like, we're going to win. So we yeah. set all these records. We set all these offensive records, all these WNBA records as a season. But in our locker room, we had this biggest target on our back, but in our locker room, pressure is a privilege. Like, mm-hmm. this is exactly where we wanted to be. This is exactly what we set out to do. Pressure is the privilege. Seeing the Aces in the semifinal, that was scary. That was scary because yeah. they still had Liz. It was a really good matchup. Took it to game five. Um, and we came out of that going against Connecticut. That was like, cool. It is we are going to be battle tested and it went to a game five. That's probably the best series championship series in the last few years. And I'm not just saying yeah. that cause I played in it, but you just literally didn't know who was going to win. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that final game, there was a point where it was like four minutes left. We went, or like six minutes left. We went down by eight. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh shit, y'all. And then here I come. I hit two threes. We right back <laughs> so in. Here thing. I go. 
Here I go. We hit two big, and I had not hit a shot the whole game. Like Mm -hmm. I say that because I had not hit a shot the whole game. And here are my teammates still being confident in me enough. I think one came from Emma and the other one came from Christy Tolliver passing me the ball to shoot the three and being like, Mm -hmm. shoot that bitch. Yeah. After I hit those two threes, we didn't look back. And when that Mm -hmm. final buzzer went off, I ran to Elena. Like I dropped the ball before the ball, like the clock even went down. And I looked at her and I was like, we fucking did it. Like, yeah, we did it. And to see like, as a point guard, there is nothing more that I wanted to do than to bring Elena Dellen on her first championship. She had every accolade in her career except for a Mm -hmm. WNBA championship. That's why she came to us. During that year, 50, 40, 90. That's what yeah. that girl was. 50, 40, which is, 90, MVP. Which is incredible. Never incredible. been done in the women's game before. Mm-hmm. Like, again, three herniated discs. Three herniated yeah. discs. And we won. Um, and DC was behind us. When I came in to DC in 2015, no one knew about the Mystics. Yeah. Now, uh, we can't walk anywhere without being noticed. And that's like, that is the coolest thing for me to see because that means we're having impact on our community Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. that means that like our community is coming behind us so i don't know that was such a surreal moment for me being a mid-major kid and underdog i mean i ran to my mama like as when i was done hugging the lane i ran up into the stands ran to my parents my family that was up there just boohoo and crying and Mm -hmm. That just, I can't even tell you that moment was so surreal. But I will say, I'm pissed we never got our parade. We never got our oh, parade. You never did. It. COVID happened. COVID happened right after it. Gotcha. So it was like, y'all gonna run this parade back because we fucking deserve that shit. I'm, deserve- I'm like, I wanna be drunk back. on the bus too, running through the city. Like, I wanna be like Asia drinking four locos out here too. So you guys had that amazing championship run, right? It just culminated to this amazing season. And then you talked about the next year, COVID happened. Bubble season, there's a lot going on. And during that season, George Floyd, all these different social activism movements, all these different Mm -hmm. things. And you were one of the most vocal athletes across not just WNBA, but Mm -hmm. all sports, being out in the media, talking about these different things, being at protests, all this different stuff in that social climate that we were in. So how was it balancing being an activist and standing up what you believe in being an athlete, but it wasn't like you, be- you meshed the two together, which is yeah. something that we hadn't really seen before on such a big stage. So yeah. what was that experience like for you being so outspoken and just respected for that on some places, but it's also backlash coming. So what was that like? In 2020, that decision, I was the hardest decision of my life to sit that year out. Um, coming off a championship, coming off a personal best season for me. Mm -hmm. I woke up one morning and was like, this is what I'm finna do because I, this has been weighing on my heart and I don't feel like I can go into the bubble and be a champion on the floor and for my team and also be a champion in my community as well. Because that bubble, what people didn't entail, that bubble, you couldn't leave. Like you couldn't ever leave because COVID was literally just hitting us. So I want to be in the rooms that are having hard dialogues and passing legislation and making decisions. I want to be on the front lines at protests. I, I want to, as athletes, we can be put on such a pedestal sometimes. Take us off because we face these same mm-hmm. problems every single day and you guys need to see us as a part of the solution. And so the only way that we can bring a solution is by listening to the people that it affects the most. So that's what I did. I linked up with grassroots organizations that have devoted their entire lives and their entire beings to these causes. I understood that I don't know everything, but I understand that I have a really good heart. I know right from wrong. I'm very intelligent. I Mm -hmm. understand how things are supposed to work. I understand how our government works, but how it really is supposed to be intended to work. But like how America operates is intentional. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to operate this way in a way that it keeps black and brown people out and down. And so it's like, what are the tangibles that I, as an athlete with my platform, with all the people that I do, with all the resources that I can utilize with the Mystics organization, with our friendships of like knowing each other, knowing the NBA players, like how yeah. do we combine our platforms during this time to really implement change that this country needs? and. Um, I'm really proud of myself for that year because I learned so much about myself. 
I learned so much about um, humanity too, of like, we're not in this alone. And yeah. I think that was the, the bridge of the gap that we needed especially between us and the NBA, they had separated mm-hmm. us for so long. And why do they separate us? Because our platforms are more powerful together. So yeah. I think finally, like being able to be in those rooms to, to partner up with our NBA brothers and be like, all right, what are we doing? Like, mm-hmm. what are we doing to better our communities? What are we doing to uh, make sure that we're shedding light on issues that face people that look like us every single day? How do we make voting easier in an election that means so much to this country? How do we, like, it was crazy. People are like, oh, you just took the year off and all this stuff. I'm like, I worked from morning until night. And what people don't understand is this is traumatic. So Mm -hmm. every single day from nine to like five, I'm reliving my traumas I'm Mm -hmm. trying to be vulnerable so other people can understand. I'm having to deal with ignorance and privilege because they don't understand. And then on top of it, I'm just having to deal with blatant racism, ignorance, like just like, oh my God, just, it doesn't make sense. Like it just doesn't make sense. So there was a lot of nights that I ended up just like, I would have to turn my phone off. I would be so depleted. I would cry. I would, it was not easy in any sense, but again, just following on, like God has a bigger prophecy for me. And I truly believe that this is what it is. And trusting that even though I sat out the W season, like because I followed his plan for my life, that he will always provide. And Converse was such a huge piece in that too, because I went into that understanding I was taking zero dollars from my salary. Yeah. So I didn't know what I was going to do, Haley. Like, Mm -hmm. just being honest with you, I don't play overseas like that anymore. I maybe did like maybe three years overseas. So it's like I'm watching my account dwindle down. And here comes Converse being like, yeah, here comes Converse being like, hey, we love you. We support you. This is exactly why we signed you to not only your talent on the floor, but who you are for your community off the floor. We're going to make sure Mm -hmm. your family is okay during this time. And we're going to pay your WNBA salary. When I tell you, like, I got That's chills amazing. talking about it now. I sobbed. Like, yeah, I sobbed because that that moment for me was God will always provide. When mm-hmm. you follow what his plan is for your life, when you just lean into the things that you know are right, he will always provide. And so I'm really thankful for Congress for that, but also just thankful for the people that I worked with along the way, um, the people that teamed up with me, the people that educated me and helped me be what I was during that time for the community that desperately needed it. The platforms that we have, the things that we're able to do from it, a lot of it comes from this newfound coverage that women's sports is getting. And yeah, it's, it's, it's about it's, time. Yeah. And it's a line <laughs> of like, you know, being appreciative and thankful of where we are and where we mm-hmm. are, but like, you're still wanting more. You're unsatisfied yes, with where we're at. But it's sure. been growing. And what do you, what do you think are some of the ways that the coverage of the game has been getting better over the years that you've been in the league and even through college, like you've seen it really grow throughout your career. So what has that been like to be a part of that change? It's been really cool um, because obviously now that you're in the league, I know you feel it too. Like we want to leave this game better than when we found it. And Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I've been a part of the 144 that has made this league and pushed it forward to the point that you can come in and get more coverage. And Mm -hmm. that doesn't also take away from what you did in college and what like other college players are doing. Like the fact that LSU and Iowa game like was as popular as it was. I went to it. I was so excited. Like I went (laughs) to it. Like it was really, really dope to just finally see like we've been deserving of this. We deserve the same respect we deserve the same um investments Mm -hmm. that all of our counterparts get when it comes to being supported and so when i came in in 2015 it was like we got a lot of work to do y'all like this ain't really necessarily it um but obviously we've worked our asses off to get to this point i think the biggest changes have been like obviously investments into our league um from different companies uh the the main thing is the media right Mm -hmm. like the media that covers us. I'm like little things like TNT. Candace Parker is on your shit all the time. Why have you not played the W game yet? Yeah. Why have you not made that investment into our league when you have one of the best that has ever played the game of basketball under your contract to begin with? Like, mm-hmm. so that's the part that kills me is, is 
still not seeing the full investment into women in sports. Like even we can talk about the NWSL. I won't even talk about the WNBA. Like I think they've made a crazy ass jump in the last two or three years. For real. And, and it's from yeah. what investment of women, like the fact that you have women owners that are like actresses and you have people that are CEOs and women CEOs that are investing into your league. I love that. Mm-hmm. Now, where I get mad is where is the disconnect? Mm-hmm. What does your demographic look like opposed to what our demographic look like? And then it becomes yeah. a conversation of why do we not support black women? Mm-hmm. So that's still where I very much feel like we need to grow is our investment into black women. Because I see it in the NWSL. I, I see mm-hmm. the investment into white women and I mm-hmm. love it. There is nothing that makes me happier. I'm trying to go to a game on the 15th in LA. Like, yeah, yeah. I love that shit. I love that we have um, the spirit in DC. I go to the games all the time. Like Trinity Rodman, that was when we drafted her, I was so hyped. I was like a <laughs> yeah. fan girl. So I love it. But like, that's, that's the thing that still gets me is that people are like, why do you always talk about race? Because unfortunately I have to. Yeah. Unfortunately I have to. So while our league has grown tremendously over the last eight years that I've been a part of it, we still have so much room to go. Mm-hmm. And that just simply comes from people respecting investing into black women. So yeah. I don't know when that's going to change. Uh, I hope that we continue. We're obviously going to continue to push, but the one thing that I will say, I'm so proud of black and brown women over the last few years. We don't settle for shit anymore. You're not giving mm-hmm. us crumbs. We're not accepting crumbs anymore. We want a meal. Why? Cause we the meal. We want a whole meal. Give me the full course meal. You are correct. You not, not you blushing a little bit. The, anal- <laughs> the, the analogies all day have been killing all me. Day. So good. So we're going to head into our last section, which is Ooh. a rapid fire portion we call the vibe check. Oh, we like a vibe check. Okay. So what's the one drill you never want to see on your practice plan? Anything full court. <laughs> Easy. I want to say half court. Yeah. Is this protract? No. Like we could go for three hours half court, but just make it half court. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. Who's best dressed in the league? There's a few. I'm going to put myself uh-huh. there. Slim, Shatori, Enrique, Diamond, Izzy, um, and Olivia. Olivia oh. from Connecticut. She's been yep. going crazy. And you she know what? We're going gonna to talk about uh, Christina Nigwe because that's who's been styling her. And her, also styling her line? Tiff Hayes. Oof. Tiff Hayes. She's been uh-huh. styling the both of them. So if y'all haven't tuned in, go go check out Christine's line because that shit is crazy. She's so talented. Great plug. Game winning shot or game winning block? Game winning block. We defense first. Love it. And one or three pointer? And one because I'm going to flip. <laughs> and one! Get some of this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Toughest place to play in the W? Ooh, New York. New York is tough. New York is that tough. That is tough. Um, what's your go-to trash talk line? Oh, this ain't what you want. I got to go with my Philly song. This ain't what you want. <laughs> I'm weak. No, I'm I've weak. also used, I've also used you not about that life because a lot of people in our league tried to talk shit, but I'm like, but you won't see me outside after this. So you yeah, not, not about, about that it. life. <laughs> All right. Those are good. Those are good. Um, who's the biggest trash talker in the league? Oh, my gosh. Whew. There's a lot. I, there's a lot. It's hard to pick. I think recently Tiff is funny. Like Tiff will talk her shit. And that, yeah. that's funny. Um, Slim won't necessarily talk unless she's like egged on to talk. Then she's going to talk her shit. Uh, Marina. Uh, Marina's a shit talker. Mabry, she is a shit she be talker. Talking. She be yeah. talking. She do be talking. She do be the talking. Other one, people the other one people be saying is DT. DT talks. Oh, what? Talks. D- All right. Um, who's the hardest player to guard? For me, Satu, because Satu is 6'5". So there's yeah. like, there's only so much I can do, right? Of like mm-hmm. staying in front of her. Satu is really hard to guard. Arike is so hard to guard. That yeah. girl is just like, she can shoot when she comes over half court. Yeah. Uh, Tiff, Tiff is another player. Alicia Gray is another player. And Ryan. Um, okay. Who's got the best handles? Chelsea Gray. Yeah, insane. Uh, insane. 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 And then biggest flopper. Oh, Sophie Cunningham. <laughs> Sophie Cunningham or Sabrina Ionescu. 
Common I'm, I'm saying y'all names. Listen, we love y'all. Y'all great hoopers, but y'all be motherfucking flopping out here and it makes me so mad because they give you the calls. They give you the calls. You're too good. Okay. Um, <laughs> your, your biggest basketball ick. Mistakes happen, right? Mistakes yeah. are a part of the game. We're trying to be perfect in an imperfect game. Don't make the same mistake two, three times. All right. Don't, yeah. don't make the same. And then if another one, if we come out of a timeout and you don't know the play that we just drew up, I'm pissed. Because you could have asked. You could have mm-hmm. asked. Mm-hmm. There was too much time for you to ask for him to redraw it up or to ask me as your point guard, where am I supposed to be? Yeah. Because now yeah, yeah, yeah. you're running the wrong and I'm being guarded 90 feet from the basket and you're pissing me off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one got some passion. Earbud came flying out. Everybody came flying out. You better know. You better okay. know. <laughs> Damn it. Like, okay, I feel like you know your answer, but who, who's your goat? Oh, my goat always Elena Deladon. Yep. My, my goat is always Elena. Outside of Elena, Sue is my goat. Okay. Sue is okay. my goat. Those are, yeah. Those are good picks. Those are good picks. Our last question is your best impersonation of, of Coach T. Give it to <laughs> us. <laughs> So Coach G actually doesn't do a lot of like, he he won't verbalize his frustration, but mm-hmm. like he is very much a, he's going to get beat red. And the minute that you see his hands go to his head, <laughs> he's not, he's not like much of a talker, but if he gets but red the hand, the hand and the, the hand, if the hand goes to the forehead and back, like. When I see him do it, it immediately still triggers me to be like, oh, we're oh, fucking yeah. up. We oh, are yeah. messing up. So yeah, I feel like that's... every coach, every coach has that thing. And it's just like y- y- you freak out. It's like PTSD. It's like, oh, my yes. God. Like oh my, my high huh. school coach, my high school coach do this day. If I hear a whistle, I'm like, where is she? She's where here. She? <laughs> but it's a thing. This has been so much fun. Thank you so uh, much for being you. on. This I has been every so moment. Much. I'm glad I got to know you on a deeper level too, because right, yes. I could be a fan from the far, but I, <laughs> I really am a fan of not only your play, but who you are as a person. And I love you and your boyfriend's TikToks. <laughs> when y'all did that. Oh, girl. <laughs> you are hilarious. You are hilarious, but no. Him. This yes, has been so great. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm a huge I'm fan. A huge fan. That's a mutual huge thing. Fan. This has been another episode of Sometimes I Hoop. Thank you everyone for tuning in and stay tuned for more.